Hi, so thank you all for coming out on this horrible day. I, I know it took me a while to get out of my driveway, so probably the same for you. <laughs> so I am going to talk a lot about smoke signals, but I will also talk about representations of Native Americans in other films. So I will begin. I'm, as you may have noted, um, also focused in on in the environment in film, so there will be some references to that in the paper. On July 4th, 1898, Quanta Parker asserted, we fear your success. This was a pretty country you took away from us, but you see how dry it is now. It is only good for red ants, coyotes, and cattlemen. This is the country we see in Western films. Although American Indians in the American landscape were portrayed sympathetically in silent films such as The Red Girl, Sorry, it's not going forward. Oh, there we go, good, sorry. Such as The Red Girl from 1908, Hiawatha from 1913, and of course, the Daughters of Dawn, the Daughter of Dawn from 1920, which you guys will be watching later, hopefully. And here are some more images from that because you'll have a lot of a couple of Quanta Parker's kids in the film. And the Vanishing American from 1925, which I'll talk a little bit more later. In most later Westerns, these representations primarily turn savage. According to Scott Simmon, they devolve along two paths, one about war, the other about love, neither leading anywhere except Indian death. Films highlighting Quanta Parker, such as Comanche and The Searchers, illustrate this change. It is only when they are constructed by American Indian filmmakers, such as Chris Ayer and Sherman Alexie, that representations of American Indians regain authenticity and serve as more powerful critiques of environmental degradation. In a scene near the middle of Sherman Alexie's smoke signals, for example, Victor Joseph, Adam Beach, exclaims, there ain't any salmon in that river no more, when his traveling companion Thomas builds a fire, Evan Adams, begins telling him about his dream of a fertile Spokane River thriving with fish. Victor's exclamation not only stops sto Thomas's storytelling, however, it also opens up space for a solution to environmental degradation shown through Victor's own dream telling. A nightmare about his own boyhood attempts to wake up his drunk parents who are passed out after a party. In retaliation, Victor smashes empty beer bottles against his father's truck, seemingly merely expressing his anger. But the action also empowers him offering a solution to at least one of the causes of the disaster he sees around him on the Coeur d'Alene Reservation. In his dream, then, Victor is finding a way to turn the hell of his reservation household into a home. Even as a child, he attempts to adapt his environment to make it more habitable, just as Thomas adapts a lifeless river into a thriving ecosystem through his dreams. Western films in which American Indian characters are highlighted rest on this idea of adapting horrific environments into homes, on what we call narratives of environmental adaptation. Although Westerns with American Indians at the center or the, on their edges do construct American Indians as either savage or noble others, the films also, and most importantly for us, demonstrate how effectively American Indians have adapted and adapted to what white settlers see as an environmental hell or something else as Fort Lowell Commander Major Cartwright Douglas Watson puts in Ulzana's Raid. You know, that, you know what General Sheridan said of that country, Lieutenant? If he owned hell in Arizona, he'd live in hell and rent out Arizona. <laughs> in a move toward a more sustainable view of prairie and desert ecosystems, American Indians in a variety of Western films adapt a seemingly lifeless environment into a place they can call home. This narrative of environmental adaptation continues even into contemporary Western films set on and near reservation lands and gains particular force in Sherman Alexie's smoke signals. Pardon Chato's perspective in Chato's Land 
helps illustrate the parameters and repercussions of such environmental adaptation. The film highlights the Apache worldview from a white perspective, but provides insight into how Chato, a half, a half Apache mestizo, survives in what seems like uninhabitable land. According to Captain Quincy Whitmore, when Chato runs from the captain because he killed a U.S. Marshal in self-defense, he, quote, picks his ground carefully. Let me get some more pictures here. Unlike white soldiers, Chato has adapted to this in inhospitable land and can use it to his advantage in a fight. The captain explains the wisdom of Chato's choice to run through Indian territory. To you, this is so much bad land, rock, scrub, desert, and then more rock, a hard land that the sun has sucked all the good out of. You can't farm it, and you can't carve it out and call it your own, so you damn it to hell, and it all looks the same. That is our way. To the breed now, it's his land. He don't expect it to give him much, and he don't force it none, and to him, it's almost human, a living, active thing, and it will make him a good place to make his fight against us. The narrative of environmental adaptation evolves in U.S. Western films with American Indians at their center, from the early valorization of American Indian worldviews through the vilification of the savage ended in the 1940s and 50s, back to a more revisionist, if sometimes condescending, look at American Indian perspectives from the 1950s and 60s through the 90s that makes way for the Native American-centered narratives to come. A review of Smoke Signals and Rolling Stone, for example, asserts, when it comes to American Indians, Hollywood either trades in Indian stereotypes or dances with Disney. <laughs> Westerns as a genre tend to focus on Plains Indian tribes, the nomadic tribes and the Plains settlers crossed to reach the West, with little distinction between the tribes. But the films also respond to film history, a history that coincides with political and cultural history of both Hollywood and the United States as a whole. According to Simon, <clears throat> Indians may well have entered American film for the reason they came into the European tradition as a whole, searching for stories to set in the landscape. Pioneer filmmakers stumbled upon Indians, the presumed men of nature. Set in eastern lush forests instead of desert plains, the narratives of these early silent westerns are set entirely within tribal communities or feature a noble redskin as guide or savior to the white hero. By 1914, however, Simon asserts, American Indian actors and sympathetic narratives were no longer prominent in Westerns, at least partly because you, the U.S. began planning with some innocence for America's entry into World War I uh, by requisitioning horses. According to Simon, uh, the subsequent history of Indian images in silent era, era Hollywood becomes a story with two paths, one about war, the other about love, neither leading anywhere except Indian death. In spite of Simmons' contention, at least a few Westerns highlighting American Indian characters and narratives present a more sympathetic view of a possible comic evolutionary narrative, a narrative of environmental adaptation that reveals the ineffectiveness of a tragic evolutionary path and the intruder pioneers who seek destruction rather than adaptation. Although racially flawed, The Vanishing American and The Miracle Worker um, sorry, The Miracle Rider, <laughs> sorry, serve as two Western films prior to World War II, which draw on this more sympathetic perspective. The Vanishing American traces a history of domination of American Indians by pioneering intruders, including that of Booker, a white Indian agent overseeing a Navajo reservation where he mistreats the Navajo and steals their horses. Nafai, Richard Dix, an educated Navajo who fought in World War I, is torn between his people and his white teacher, Marion Warner, when he returns from the war and ultimately is sacrificed as he fights against Booker to regain his people's dignity. Miscegenation is avoided because of Nafai's death, but the film's prologue especially foregrounds a history of conquest, one that is lamented, even if painted as inevitable in the film. Here are a few images from that. The Miracle Rider, a Tom Mix serial, opens with a chapter that is also dedicated to the vanishing Indian. The episode provides a historical background that bifurcates 
American Indians willing to adapt to their environment from their white opponents, demonstrating how a tragic evolutionary narrative destroys both American Indians and their hunting grounds. They both valorize a comic evolutionary narrative, one from a silent, big-budget Western perspective, the other from a small-budget Western serial point of view, but they both also demonstrate the futility of such valorization. From Drums Along the Mohawk through Cheyenne, Adam, Cheyenne Autumn, John Ford defines the idea of the West in relation to populist views of progress, a progress that seeks to dominate human and non-human nature and civilize the wilderness. Within this ideology, American Indians must either be exterminated or removed to make way for pioneers ready to turn the forest wilderness into a garden. Although Ford's later Western films seem to gain more sympathy for American Indians and their plight, the results are the same, exploitation of nature for the sake of progress. As Ken Nolly asserts in The Representation of Conquest, John Ford and the Hollywood Indian, all of Ford's plots, with the exception of Cheyenne Autumn, construct Indians as a savage presence set in opposition to the advance of American civilization, particularly as that civilization is embodied in white families. That opposition also points to a battle with the natural world and a possible narrative of environmental adaptation. No matter how noble a savage the American Indian might be, they cannot assimilate into Western culture, according to these films, and must be removed to reservations or destroyed. American Indians, like other human and non-human nature, must be exploited for gain or, if they limit the construction of, of civilization, annihilated. Other Western films address the American Indian perspective on adapting to their land in less obvious ways. The Scalp Hunters, for example, complicates received beliefs regarding both American Indians and Comancheros when a group of American Indians exchanges Trapper Joe's this is Burke Lancaster, one of my favorites, and, and animal hides for an escaped slave named Joseph, Ossie Davis. Uh, when the American Indians are raided by Comancheros led by Jim Howie, that's Telly Savalas, uh, racial binaries begin to disintegrate, making room for accommodation and a collective view of human and non-human nature. And the outlaw Josie Wales examines American Indian worldviews both peripherally and from a first-person point, point of view through the eyes of Lone Wolf. Um, who becomes a part of a family of cast-offs, including Josie Wales. Majority of Westerns, however, construct American Indians as an other who must be destroyed or vanquished for civilization to prosper. But even films like The Searchers provide a more complex look at American Indians when scrutinized through a narrative of environmental adaptation. Although American Indians seem to be constructed as either savages or innocents in most Western films with less maturity than Euro-Americans, their view of landscape and land use is usually valorized, especially from the mid-1950s forward. In these films, American Indians represent a more environmentally conscious perspective than that of Euro-Americans and signify the possibility for a simpler and less cynical view of life. In dances in, uh, with wolves, for example, uh, Ten Bears, the chief of the Sioux tribe, befriended by U.S. soldier John Dun Dunbar, uh, Kevin Costner, explains how whites take without asking. And there are a couple images from that. These narratives of environmental adaptation become more convincing, however, in the 1990s and 2000s, when American Indians begin telling their own stories, both as filmmakers and actors written by Spokane Coeur d'Alene Indian Sherman Alexie and directed by a Cheyenne Arapaho, Chris Ayer, Smoke Signals illustrates how American Indians still transform hell into a home. <laughs> In a narrative of environmental adaptation centering on two fatherless young men exploring their heritage outside the reservation. Now, I th I'm going to just show the film behind me while I read, or well, I guess beside me, instead of showing you PowerPoint slides. Hopefully. So just watch the film and don't look at me. <laughs> In Smoke Signals, the ecological Indian faces neither banishment nor annihilation because he adapts the hell of both the reservation and the wider Eurocentric world into a home. The narrative in Smoke Signals adds both a collaborative component and a search outside the self, in this case, for a father's ashes as the key to his truth. 
More importantly, the narrative centers on transforming the protagonist's starting and ending point in, into a home. In Smoke Signals, characters do gain self-awareness, but the awareness extends to both others and their own seemingly barren and hopeless setting, the Coeur d'Alene Reservation. By translating four of a series of disjointed and primarily bitter stories from the Lone Ranger and Tonto Fistfight in Heaven into a filmic collaborative journey with what he calls integrity, Sherman Alexi has constructed a narrative of environmental adaptation with a clear and cohesive structure that follows an evolutionary pattern focused on place. Characters in Smoke Signals embrace a focus on adapting themselves to their circumstances in every possible way, while the film adds the element of ecology. The director emphasizes this relationship between human and non-human nature by successfully fulfilling Alexi's goal to, quote, let the landscape tell a lot of the story. Not only outside the bus window and along the paths Victor Joseph and Thomas builds a fire follow toward Mars, Arizona, where Victor's father's ashes remain, but also within Victor and Thomas themselves. As Thomas explains, quote, you know, there are some children who aren't really children at all. They're just pillars of flame that burn everything they touch. And there are children who are just pillars of ash that fall apart when you touch them. Victor and me, we were children of flame and ash. To build this narrative, the film follows a three-act narrative grounded, grounded in ecology. Act one is establishing the reservation as an inhospitable setting for human and non-human nature. Two, leaving the reservation on a journey of landscapes. And three, returning to the reservation, able to transform hell into a home. The reservation's ecology seems less than life-sustaining during the film's first act. Smoke Signals begins in 1976 with an announcement from the reservation radio station K-Res. It is White People's Independence Day, Randy Peon, the DJ, explains before switching to Lester Falls Apart on the broken down K-Res van at the crossroads. Quote, big truck just went by, now it's gone. Falls Apart states, reinforcing the empty world of the reservation. The broadcast bridges to a house party that joins the bleak and physical environment with reservation social life while it begins the film's narrative. The party celebrates the 4th of July and the bitter emptiness it leaves for American Indians less than independent on the res. Social images of reservation life highlight some of the real economic, environmental, and social problems still prevalent for American Indians. In one scene, for example, we see a drunken Arnold Joseph, Gary Farmer, Victor's father, who stumbles out of his house throwing firecrackers to prolong the celebration. Beer cans and fireworks cover the lawn. The party is over, but Arnold fires a Roman candle into the house and the curtains and living room furniture burst into flames. Thomas's voice tells us that the fire swallowed up my mother and father but Arnold catches an infant thrown from an upper store window, saving it from the raging fire. It is Thomas, and Arnold places him in the arms of his grandmother. When the grandmother thanks him, he says he didn't mean to, a sign of his guilt that he will carry, uh, that the father validates when he cuts his hair. And as Thomas states, practices vanishing. Thomas and Victor have almost literally been, been born of flame and ash on a reservation where the only hope seems to be survival. 22 years later, the same radio DJ broadcasts, quote, it's a good day to be indigenous. But life on the reservation is still bleak and barren of hope, and the flat brown landscape reflects that desolation. The DJ reports on the few passing cars and the story surrounding each driver, but the road is empty. The Coeur d'Alene Reservation isolates American Indians, the scene suggests, leaving them on a desert-like island with few prospects for economic gain or environmental fecundity. A scene in a school gym where three young men play basketball reinforces this image. Thomas, wearing a suit, tells stories from the gym stage. Quote, when Indians go away, they don't come back, Thomas says with novels like The Last of the Mohicans to back up his claim. The story acts as a bridge to a phone call received by Victor's mother, Arlene, Tantu Cardinal, and Arnold Joseph has passed away in Mars, Arizona, and Victor must find a way to bring him back home. But narratively, the forthcoming trip also highlights the inevitable path of the American Indian according to their history. 
American Indians have been removed to reservations or annihilated, so their representation vanishes from the face of the American myth. Efforts to facilitate Victor's journey are thwarted because of the hopeless state of both Victor and the reservation. In the reservation grocery store, Thomas, who has heard it on the wind and seen Victor's mother crying, offers to pay for Victor's trip as long as Victor takes him along. But Victor thinks about his father driving him around on the reservation for the last time, showing off his magic while drinking beer out of a cooler next to him. The buildings father and son pass are dilapidated, and they sit on hard-packed dirt, accentuating the lifeless state of the reservation. Arnold tells Victor, I wave my hand and white people are gone. Everything he waves at, he says, will disappear. The reservations, the drunks, the Catholics, the drunk Catholics. I'm so, I'm so good, I'll make myself disappear. And he does. Arnold has so internalized the hell of the reservation and the message it represents that he literally vanishes. Victor, too, has internalized the dissolution around him and its manifestation in Arnold, empty despair. The opening act closes when Victor and Thomas consult with their mother figures and move closer to their journey. Uh-oh. What happened? I'm not sure what happened, so we're going to go to the PowerPoint. I apologize. Sorry about that. Although Victor bears his pain in isolation, Thomas helps his grandmother make fry bread, gaining confidence that Victor will agree to travel with him to Arizona. The scene also illustrates the communal strength on which environmental adaptation can be built. Victor associates fry bread with relationship building when he hugs his mom and compliments her on her bread, the best on the reservation. Arlene's story about fry bread makes Victor make his decision about taking Thomas. I don't make it by myself, Arlene tells him. I got the recipe from my grandmother and she got it from her grandmother and I listen to people, she says, showing him how building a new and better life or fry bread requires a collective process. I can show you some fry bread. There's some fry bread. <laughs> As if the beginning of the bus trip prompts two more stories about Victor's father, one in flashback from Victor's perspective. Uh-oh. Sorry. As if transformed but wearing a shirt that reads... Uh, oh. I apologize. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Oh. As if responding to this communal vision, Victor goes to Thomas's house to invite him to this journey, and the setting and tone begin to change. For example, when Victor and Thomas walk toward the bus that will take them from Spokane to Phoenix, Arizona, a comic tone overcomes the isolation in Act One. They meet Velma and Lucy driving in reverse because their car's transmission is broken. According to the cineast interview with Alexi, the two women in their car provided sense of time in the movie when the past, present, and future are all the same. That circular sense of time which plays itself out in the seamless transitions from past to present. There they are. For Alexi, this is a visual metaphor for the adage, sometimes you go forward, sometimes to go forward you have to drive in reverse. <laughs> The Velma and Lucy storyline pays homage to Thelma and Louise, but without the hopeless suicide pact that ends the white women's filmic lives. Instead of driving off a cliff, the two young women flirt with Thomas and Victor, giving them a ride only after Thomas tells them a story that reveals something about Arnold and his work for uh, the American Indian movement, AIM. Arnold got arrested, you know, but he got lucky. They charged him with attempted murder, then they plea bargained that down to assault with a deadly weapon. Then they plea bargained that down to being an Indian in the 20th century. <laughs> then he got two years in Walla Walla. <laughs> 
The story also provides a comic turn in the film, especially when Velma laughs. Quote, I think it's a fine example of the oral tradition. <laughs> The young men's journey off the reservation begins with Victor and Thomas uh, entering a bus, a modern stagecoach going east to Arizona instead of west. Lucy and Velma tell them they are going to a whole other country since to the young women the United States is as foreign as it gets. Dramatic changes in the film's ecology reinforce these words as the bus carries Victor and Thomas across the flat, brown, step-like landscapes to the red rock of the southwest. And we'll go back to some of that. The beginning of this bus trip prompts two more stories about Victor's father, one in flashback from Victor's perspective, the other directly from Thomas. These stories demonstrate that Victor and Thomas and their environment are moving from a lifeless and hopeless state toward the hope of life. Flashback seems like a dream that is broken by Thomas's story. Victor's story centers on another house party, this time before the celebrants have passed out for the night. Arnold and Arlene, now both drunk, ask young Victor about his favorite Indian, and he yells, nobody, repeatedly, and runs away. Before the story ends, Thomas tells Victor another story about his father that reveals a more hopeful take both on Arnold and his environment. In this story, Thomas sits on a bridge in Spokane, watching salmon run. Arnold sees him and invites him to breakfast at Denny's. As Thomas says, sometimes it's a good day to die, Sometimes it's a good day to eat breakfast. <laughs> the Spokane River is clear and running wildly with fish in this story, but Victor exclaims, there ain't any salmon in that river no more before flashing back to his own dream. The party is over now in the dream, and Victor sees his parents passed out fully clothed on their bed. He runs from the room, and we hear banging noises. Victor is throwing beer bottles at Arnold's truck, breaking them one by one. The hopeless drug state of the reservation is critiqued here, but in the context both of one solution, getting rid of the alcohol, and a more natural alternative, a return to the life-filled river. The return to the river is metaphorical, but it is also signifies a return to life, following a narrative of environmental adaptation that facilitates transforming a lifeless environment into a home. This metaphor is reinforced when Victor insists that Thomas take off his suit, complete with vest, and take down his hair to become a real Indian. He tells Thomas, you've got to look like you just came back from killing a buffalo. But Thomas knows better and explains, but we were fishermen. Let's see if we can find that one. There he is. When Thomas stops at a gas station and changes his clothes, he returns, seemingly transformed, but wearing a shirt that reads Fry Bread Power. Now they both can be stoic, as Victor asserts, and survive in a white world. They also adapt to the world of white Western popular culture when two cowboys steal their bus seat and refuse to move, telling them to find somewhere else to have a powwow. Thomas notes their failure, but together they return the potential conflict into a success. Uh, Thomas begins by saying the cowboys always win and lists a few from Tom Mix to John Wayne, noted earlier. But Victor laughs, remembering, in all these, those movies, you never saw John Wayne's teeth. And the two build a chant around John Wayne's teeth. Here the landscape tells their story through the window of the bus where red rocky hills line the road toward Phoenix, emphasizing the hardship they, that they must face on their journey. Get some more of these. The walk from Phoenix to Mars, Arizona provides one of these challenges. They walk through desert grasslands that for Thomas signify American Indians' continuous movement west. Columbus shows up and we keep walking, he says, and then repeats the mantra for historical white figures from Custer to Harry Truman. Yet Thomas slips in humor again to counter the setting and the message saying that Victor's dad looks like Charles Bronson. Mars, Arizona, on the other hand, looks like a crater in the desert 
The two trailers break the gold loneliness of the valley. When the two arrive in the valley, Susie Song, Irene Bedard, uh, greets them and offers Victor his father's ashes. A Western is on Susie's television and Thomas jokes, the only thing more pathetic than Indians on TV is Indians watching Indians on TV. <laughs> Susie's willingness to help them and clear affinity with Victor's father serves as the opening of a story that brings them closer to hope and life. Thomas tells about Victor's mother feeding a hundred a hundred hungry American Indians with 50 pieces of fry bread, a clear reference to the loaves and fishes parable from the Sermon of the Mount. Thomas accentuates Arlene's struggle to determine how to feed so many people, ending with a practical solution, tearing the bread in half so each person gets a portion. The story again reinforces the need to work collectively to adapt to a sometimes hostile environment. Victor learns more about his father from Susie, reenacts his father's ritual haircutting when collecting personal items from Arnold's trailer, and then leaves with Thomas in Arnold's truck. To Thomas, the connection between human and non-human nature drives their departure. Susie in drought, mother in hunger, father in magic, all heavy with illusion, he says. One last conflict moves Victor and Thomas toward environmental adaptation and serves as the entrance into the third act of the film. While fighting over visions of, the, of Victor's father, Victor and Thomas crash Arnold's truck, avoiding a car parked in the middle of the highway. They turn what could be a dangerous altercation with police off the res into a triumph, changing, changing Arnold's past crimes into communal solutions. Instead of leaving the scene and avoiding a confrontation with police, Victor helps an injured girl from the accident, running all the way to the town hospital for assistance. Even when questioned by the police before leaving the hospital, Thomas and Victor transform an expected altercation into a ride home. The driver of the car responsible for the accident accuses Victor of assaulting him, but before Victor can defend himself, the white police chief, Tom Skerritt, lets them go, saying, Mr. Johnson's wife, Holly, says he's, and I quote, a complete asshole. In a rewriting of Arnold's earlier arrest for participation in an AIM demonstration, the police even drive them back to their truck. This transformation of expectation coincides with Susie's burning Arnold's trailer back in Arizona, a purifying action that parallels the opening fire and cleanses Arnold and Victor of their past. The fire and ride in the police car help Victor bring life to the reservation as he brings back his father to his mom and home. Victor shares some of the ashes with Thomas after thanking him for his help. Then in a reversal of Western film's foregrounding progress, the film shows Victor and Thomas's ritual st strewing of Arnold's ashes into the Spokane River. The ashes look like magic dust as they float toward the water. Once the ashes reach the water, they race downstream like salmon. The overhead tracking shot shows the waters crashing over rocks around curves like a highway clover leaf in the movie How the West Was Won. But there's no concrete along the river. It is lined with green and shows how ashes and fire can transform into life. And we'll end there. <laughs>